Raise your hand. I know there are some of you here. Raise your hand if you like pineapple on pizza. Look at you. Yes. That is so good. Now what I want you to do, and I know some of you are here too, please be honest. Raise your hand if you think that pineapple on pizza is a damnable pizza heresy. Where are you? Where are you? Yes, there are a few. Um, Matt, you don't count. You don't even like Vegemite. That's not a thing. So, pineapple on pizza, mostly, mostly here you're saying good. I'm, I'm so glad. Listen, if you don't like pineapple, pe- pineapple on pizza, I'll pick something different for you. you can, Matt, you can think of, I think you like Skyline, right? Skyline chili. You, there it is. Mmm, Skyline chili. That's really good. Put a piece of pineapple on that thing. It's going to be even better. Um, <laughs> So, look, I'm not saying you're wrong, you're just very, very mistaken. Um, So, I love pineapple on pizza. Now, if you want to have really amazing pineapple uh, and ham and pineapple pizza, uh, you're going to have to get on a plane, come with me to Australia. You're going to have to go to a country where the basis of food groups is not corn fructose syrup, okay? And we will get pizza there from an Aussie pizza shop. It's not an Aussie name. It's called Gino's. We're actually, we actually will have to go there and do this. It's, it's amazing because Gino's uses fresh pineapple. Not any fresh pineapple. Tropical Queensland-grown pineapple. The state of, of Australia, where Bluey lives, so it's got to be good, right? And uh, you just get this very, very best pineapple. If you've had... Queensland pineapple, it's like you're eating a pineapple straight out of the Garden of Eden, not affected by sin, okay? Um, and, and you'll eat them and you'll say that before this day, you have never experienced the taste of sweetness. Now, you need to stick with me because I am going somewhere here. Keep your Bibles open at John 6. We're getting there. Uh, I, I'm actually uh, once made the mistake of ordering a different pizza from a different pizza shop and I took one bite of the ham and pineapple pizza instantly knew that it wasn't any good. They put so many different herbs, 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 I don't know, you don't say H, do you? H. Uh, So put a heap of herbs on it, and I just couldn't even taste the pineapple. And so once you've experienced the goodness of that pineapple, really, that's all you want to taste. You just want to taste that pineapple. Now let me put this to you, that we should be like that with Jesus. That's how it is with Jesus. And this is an election year, so let this be an election year sermon for you, that particularly in an election year this year, we get to focus on, well, we're going to focus on the workings of this world, aren't we? We're going to focus on what is around us and this country and everything else, and we can so easily forget that we have something so much better in Jesus. And there's something I think John in his gospel is going to do for us today in his gospel. He's going to show us what it is to see Jesus and remove any of the other ingredients that impede our view of his glory. So, here's what I want to suggest to you today, uh, and that is that when you focus on the person and purpose of Jesus, you will see that he's better than you think he is. When you focus on the person and purpose of Jesus, you will see that he is better than you think he is. So we're going to look at John chapter 6 from verse 14 through to 21. And the events that we're interested in today take place immediately after the feeding of the 5,000. Now up to this point, you're going to see the feeding of the 5,000 in all four Gospels. And coming up to this point, after the feeding of the 5,000, what we have seen coming up to it is there are accumulating crowds around Jesus... And people really do see something incredible in Jesus. He's like a rock star. He's a healer. He speaks in an amazing way. He's, he's, and, he, and people have crowded around him so much that he's said to his disciples, let's go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And they went there, but the crowd, they came around to meet him there. That's the, that's the pull that Jesus has for people. This crowd sees he is amazing, and Jesus sees this crowd and has amazing compassion for them. And he does something that is simply beyond measure, right? He feeds them. 5,000 men plus the others, right? Which is women and children. So 
a greater crowd than 5,000 with, we know what he had, right? Five loaves and two fish. Two fish. Put yourself in the shoes of the crowd for a moment. Just think about this. This is a man who speaks with wisdom. He silences his critics. He has the power to keep everybody fed with more food than your money can pay for or that they had or what they would be able to even obtain. And there was an abundance left over. Now, I want to ask you to consider with me that Jesus is better than who this crowd thinks he is. Jesus proves that he is better because his purpose is better than ours. Jesus proves that he is better because his purpose is better than ours. And so I want to see that in verse 14 and 15 first. Look at this in John 6, 14 and 15. When the, cre- when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is come into the world. Perceiving then... Excuse me. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now, we, we get our first glimpse of how the crowds view Jesus. They reckon, reckon, recognize something about him, don't they? He's a prophet, even, even could he be an expected prophet. But if you immediately look at verse 15, at least in their eyes, he's not king yet. They they want to take him by force and make him king. Now, we have the hindsight of the whole canon of Scripture, don't we? And we know by understanding in Scripture that right there and then he is king, isn't he? Right there and then. By the end of John 7, if you kept reading through these chapters, uh, coming up to the end of John 7, this crowd on the other side of the lake then is still confused about who Jesus is. Is he a prophet? Is he the Messiah? Who is he? And either way, right here, this man has something we really want. And look at Jesus in verse 15. I don't know if, if it's some general perception. We don't get the information here in this, do we? I don't know if it's a general perception. I don't know if Jesus heard mutterings amongst the crowd about what they wanted to do, or was this supernatural knowledge that Jesus had? He perceived something that they wanted to take him by force. Look at what he perceived. Look carefully at how John describes this. Perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force. Seize. Snatch. Control. It can be translated as control, even. And make him king. You know what they wanted Jesus to be? They wanted to control Jesus for their benefit like a political party would control its candidate. We'll tell you who we want you to be. Now, we never see political parties controlling their candidates, do we? We don't. I know we don't. Surely we don't. What type of king do they really want? What do they want? Jesus Later in discussing this, in John 6, 26, says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your full of the loaves. You ate your fill of the loaves. What do they really want? They want a king that will keep their bellies fed. Brothers and sisters, this 5,000 is it's predominantly a Jewish crowd in Galilee, They're supposed to be the people of God. Let me tell you, when it comes to being the people of God, we have a history of wanting the wrong type of king. 1 Samuel 8 and 9, Israel asks for a king. Not not the one who they want to represent God for the people, but because they want to be like the other nations. They want to compete in the world. Just read the Gospels and you'll constantly see the Pharisees looking for a king to replace Pilate. They don't want him. They don't want Herod, his, the, the puppet of Rome. They don't want Caesar himself. And go read Matthew 4. This is amazing. You read through Matthew 4. You read that last temptation that Satan brought to Jesus. Satan tempts Jesus by saying he is willing to give him all the kingdoms of the world if he'll just bow down to Satan. Do you think that's not tempting? 
Do you realise, hear me brothers and sisters, do you realise all the good that Jesus could do? Now Satan's not saying you are to be king of kings, you're to be under me as king ruling over the world. That's what Satan wanted. Do you realise all the good that Jesus could do? And Satan would be happy for him to do it. As long as it doesn't mean one thing. If Jesus could be the next Caesar, if Jesus could be the next President of the United States, eradicate hunger, Jesus could do that. Abolish abortion, overcome the sexual revolution, fix the medical system, fix the tax system, have true justice and the perfect approach to borders. That's what Jesus could do. And is that what we want from Jesus? Perhaps, you know, if we get enough people on board with Jesus, we could take him by force and make him our king. Can you see it, brothers and sisters? We could, we, we could stem the tide of a changing culture. If only we could get enough people to believe in Jesus, we could get America back to where it needs to be. We could have a government that is not in opposition to Christian values. Or perhaps it's even more individually personal, okay? We could preach a Jesus who will fix your personal problems. Come to Jesus and give to Jesus and he will make you wealthy. He will give you a better life and a better family. And please hear me, I'm a biblical counsellor, okay? I do believe that Jesus has given us wonderful truth in his word and it does really help people in this life, here and now, with real problems. But if Jesus is only about our temporal solutions to worldly problems and earthly benefits, we are simply not seeing him. If Jesus is only affixed to our earthly temporal problems, in fact, Paul says... It this way, we are much to be pitied. Can you just think to, with me about what this crowd sees? That Jesus needs to fix for them? Obviously, they're hungry tummies. But they also live under an oppressive Roman rule. It really is. Tax, they get taxed by it. It suppresses their identity as a nation. Of course, they want a new king to fix their problems. But here's the kicker. Their problem is bigger than what they think it is. Would you please hear that? Their problem is bigger than what they think it is. And, and until they see their problem is bigger than what they think it is, they will not see that Jesus is better than who they think he is. Can I remind you of their problem? Can I remind you of our problem? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Romans 3, 23, you know this, don't you? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I hope you realise this, Hebrews 9.27, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. What do this crowd want? They want to take him by force and make him their king. Now, I don't know what you think your biggest problem is, your tummies, the politics, other personal problems, but it all really, please hear me, it pales in significance to being under the righteous eternal condemnation because you've sinned against the creator of the universe. You could transform the culture, you can reform politics, or even if God he deems to heal your sick, sickness, make you wealthy, overcome that plaguing problem in your life, none of that helps you on the day that you stand face to face before God in judgment. So look carefully at what Jesus does with a crowd that seeks to take him by force and make him an earthly king. Somehow, somehow, don't ask me how, but the Son of God can remove himself from a very highly motivated crowd and get his disciples to the other side of the lake and go to the mountain to try, pray. You see that somehow he, somehow he gets away from this crowd that wants to take him by force and make him their king, disperses and goes to the mountain to pray. Do you find that surprising? 
that the first thing he does is Jesus goes to the mountain to pray. We might be less surprised if we think it through. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He's second in the Trinity, who's here in this world fulfilling the purposes of the eternal counsels of God set in place before the creation of the world. Which purpose do you think Jesus is more in tune with? An, an earthly motivated crowd looking for temporal relief? Or the timeless counsels of God that bring eternal glory? Is he trying to bring the crowd to be united under an American flag? Or is it much bigger than that? Is it any wonder that the Son communes right in this case most with the Father? Jesus withdrew because there was a mistake being made that was horrific. And it's easy for anyone in this room to make it. The crowd misread the miraculous signs of feeding them in wanting his power for temporal benefit of an earthly king, the fixing of their country and identity in their country, rather than seeing him as the eternal king of an eternal kingdom. And that's why I think it's so glorious that we now look directly at one of the most well-known and glorious miracles in the Bible as we see Jesus walking on water. Second thing that I want us to see as we go into verse 16 to 21 this morning, or this evening, is that Jesus proves he's better because his powerful signs point to his eternal purpose. Look at 16 to 21 with me. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea had become rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they, heard, when they had rowed, uh, uh, rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. And then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land which they were going. I want to tell you something that I love about there being four different Gospels. Ancient biographies that don't always work the way that we think modern biographies do. Okay? This account of Jesus walking on water is in three of them. And they're all different. Matthew, Mark... And John. And each gospel author, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives a different emphasis that we all need. That, by the way, I I, I just want to express this individually, is why I'm not really a fan of harmonizing gospels. I'm not saying it's sinful or wrong. Um, I I understand there can be some, some historical significant help in that but we can too easily lose the emphasis that the Holy Spirit has given to each individual author via divine inspiration in the way that they set out their Gospels. So Matthew and Mark have more, much more information about this event than John. Matthew has the whole account of Peter. You know what happens with Peter, right? Gets out of the boat, tries to walk. And Jesus needs to save him as he sinks into the water. Mark has this account of the disciples in terror, thinking that that a ghost is walking toward them. It's a ghost, it's a ghost. Well, that's helpful information. It's helpful, that has helpful application for us in those different gospels. But the failure of the disciples is not really in view here. Not in John. John doesn't want us to have that. It's it's like John takes everything off the pizza. Even the ham. So that you can have opportunity to simply taste the sweetness of the pineapple. So what we've got to do is let John focus our attention exactly on where it needs to be. Now even as I am preaching this and looking at this, please be have your heads in the text, look at John 6. Keep your eyes on it, because even in preaching, I don't want to get in the way of you seeing what John wants you to see. Listen, you don't need ham getting in the way of pineapple. Some of you got that. 
Actually, it's John's whole purpose of his gospel. Okay? John 20, verse 31. These are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. There's the purpose of the whole gospel. So let's meditate together on what we have before us here in John 6. Firstly, we have the disciples getting into a boat without Jesus. Jesus is on a mountain praying. And rowing across the sea to Capernaum. That's a seven-mile distance to the other side. And there's this statement in verse 17 about it getting dark. Now, if, if we were to give a more wooden translation of that statement, it would be something like this. It would say, it would be, already darkness had come, but Jesus had not come. There was already darkness, no Jesus. That's what John wants us to see. Neither is, is it calm, verse 18. It was rough, a strong wind, darkness and turmoil, and the disciples are in this without Jesus, and they're frightened. And, and there is this immediate contrast with what we see in Jesus. Um, they see then, the next thing that they see, he's walking on water. He introduces himself, he takes them, by shore, takes them to shore. Nice story, isn't it? So much more than that. John, by the way, who wrote this gospel, was in that boat at that very time. He was there. Can you imagine, John? Can you imagine him writing this gospel, recalling this event? Look at the contrast John wants us to see. Darkness, turmoil, fear, then immediately the only real concentration of the whole text, Jesus, walking on water. And John is, is writing this, and he's not thinking about disciples yelling out, ghost, ghost. He's not thinking about Peter trying to walk on water and then sinking. From, from that moment on, it's just Jesus. Can you imagine what's ticking over in that apostle's mind? Later on, he's reflecting on this, and he's writing. Right? He's, he's, he's writing about it. I wonder what that reflection was like. Let, let me pretend just for, pretend with me just for a minute. This is pretend. It's sanctified pretending. Imagine being John. I was in the boat. The cold wind had come over the cliffs and now created turmoil in the water. We were about a half, three and a half miles across the sea, right in the middle. It was late and it was dark. We were struggling in the darkness and then out of the darkness, he was hovering above, though walking on water, actually walking on the water, not sinking, not bound by the normal laws of creation like any of us. I, I have never seen anything like it. Who could possibly defy the workings of creation? Even birds that fly in the air stop flapping their wings and then they have to return to the ground. But this man, this man was above the water without sinking. Who could possibly operate outside of the natural world. Surely it can only be from someone who is outside, who comes from outside the natural world. Who could it be other than the eternal timeless God who created the laws that govern this world? Who could be outside the laws than the one who made the laws? And when he introduces himself to us, it was amazing. These words, and these were the actual words that, that John writes, that he heard. In Greek, ego, amy. They're Greek words that, that John is writing. Ego, amy, that Jesus said. Now to you and me, these words can be translated a number of ways. It can simply be, it's me. It was Mother's Day last week. I hope you picked up the phone and said, hi, mum, it's me. Right? That's, it could be that. It can be, I am he. And it can also be, I am. I am. Now, if you've read through John, you know these words are not a small thing for John. Neither should they be a small thing for us, for any of us who know their significance. In John 18.5, John says to the soldiers who came to arrest him on the night before his crucifixion, he did say, it's me, ego a me, these words. Do you know what happened to those soldiers? They fell down backwards. Can we understand something? 
I don't think anything the Lord does, in fact, I know that nothing the Lord, anything that the Lord does, it's not unintentional for his glory. You, can't, you, you can try to tell me that it's simply Jesus standing on the water saying, it's me, to his disciples. But even when Jesus is simply saying, it's me, he's saying, I am. And John records Jesus saying to the Pharisees in that amazing statement about his pre-incarnate existence, doesn't he? Before Abraham was, I am. And, and I am. There's these incredible seven times that he makes these I am statements in the Gospels. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the vine and more. You can't tell me that Jesus can ever walk on water before his disciples and simply say, it's me, without them knowing, without him knowing and saying, I am. And look at his words. I am. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And he says it as he stands on the rough water of the Sea of Galilee. Can you imagine the thoughts in John's mind? Wow. Wow. Can you imagine the scriptures going through John's mind? Can you imagine all the things that he knows about Jesus going through his mind? I'm not talking about when he was in the boat. I think when he was in the boat, that wasn't happening. This is later on when he was, in, when he was reflecting on it and writing his gospel. I think in the boat, it was like, a lot like when, when I was a dad for the first time and my wife Trish gave birth to our daughter, Sarah, and we had Sarah in Trisha's arms and we're just marvelling at her and the nurse says to us, is it a boy or girl? I didn't know. I didn't care. Look at this. Right? Then we found out. She actually is a girl. But now John is reflecting on this and writing this gospel. Surely he's understanding all of the Old Testament passages that make allusion to this incredible fulfillment and glory in Jesus. Maybe John 9, 2 to 8. Truly I know that it is so, but how can a man be in the right before God? If one wished to contend with him, one could not answer him once in a thousand times. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and succeeded? He who removes mountains and they know it not. When he overturns them in his anger who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble, who commands the sun and it does not rise, who seals up the stars, who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. Isn't it amazing that John sits in a boat, actually sees him with his own eyes, God incarnate, trampling the waves of the sea. All of his power. But I think John is even thinking back further than Job. Genesis chapter 1, 1 to 4. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. There was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. And what does John write right here? Darkness had come, but Jesus had not come. The water was rough and in darkness, the disciples in darkness, and then Jesus hovering over the face of the water. Not just the one who created light out of darkness, but who is the light in the darkness. Is it any wonder then that this is the very way that John began his gospel to start with? John 1. In the beginning was the word, the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And verse 9 of John 1, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And then John 1, 11 to 14, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, wow, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of 
grace and truth. Brothers and sisters, I want to give you a gift tonight. Gift. Look at Jesus. Best gift I can give you. Look at Jesus. The I am, the one who created both gravity and water and walks on it. And, and what is he doing? He's not walking on it because he's proving himself capable of dethroning Caesar and making Israel great again. Okay? It's not trying to unite us under some type of worldly flag. He's not here for our purposes. He's here for his. But it involves us. Look at the next words, verse 20. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. Immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. He's not here to scare them. He's here to save them. He's here He's there to get into the boat with them and take them all the way to shore. Isn't that a beautiful metaphor? The one who shows himself to be the creator comes as light in the darkness, gets in the boat with us, saves us from the turmoil of this world and takes us to shore. Now listen to how he explains it to the crowd. This crowd that just won't let up. Because he goes back around to the other side of the Sea of the Galilee, Galilee where his disciples are, with his disciples, he goes with them, and this one who gave over 5,000 of this crowd abundant food from one small basket, listen what he says, he says then to them in John 6, 27 to 29, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. Why is Jesus showing his awesome glory in miraculous signs? Why is John recording it? Here is the reason. So that you will believe in him. Not so that you will take him by force and make him your king. Listen, he's already king. It's so that you will believe in him. Believe in your king. Later on, Pilate is going to have a discussion with Jesus before he goes to the cross. Pilate asks about the fact that those from his own nation had handed him over to be crucified. And see what happens, you know, when, when a crowd doesn't really get what it wants, right? It yells out, crucify him. But Jesus' response to Pilate is amazing. Look at his response in John 18, 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not N-O-T of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. You see what he's saying, right? If Jesus is supposed to be taken by the crowd and made to be the new Pilate or new Herod or new Caesar or new president, what do they want when their new Caesar hangs on a cross, never to reign in Caesar's chair? What do they do? But what do you do when the one who is already king goes to the cross willingly, takes your sin on himself, bears your punishment under the full-orbed, infinite power of the wrath of God upon sin, dies in your place, then on the third day rises from the grave in eternal power and victory over death and sin, and then he places his perfect, spotless, holy, sinless, pure, glorious record on you, covering your utter sinfulness with his perfect righteousness, placing you before the Father, forgiven, adopted, loved sons and daughters of infinite mercy and grace. And he is this... For anyone who will repent of their sins and believe in him. Listen, as a Christian, you can write all sorts of things, you can show yourself, you can show what you're passionate about. Social media is a great place for you to do it. And sometimes you can sound like you're trying to make Jesus, you're trying to take him by force and make him king. Christians need to show that what we are most passionate about is that Jesus is here to forgive sins and give people eternal life. 
Listen to me. Please forget the pizza base. Please forget the sauce, the ham, the cheese, the herbs, any of it. Look at the sweetness of the pineapple, the I am. Not just on the water, John saw him, John was a witness when he was hanging on a cross. That's glory too. In all of his humility, mercy and grace, in all of the bloodiness of that, look at him, please look at him. Look at him. Your saviour, or at least he can be. Even today, look at him. Jesus is not for your own purposes. Brothers and sisters, please remind yourself. His great glorious purpose, his great glorious eternal kingdom, not for elections, not for cultures, not for wealth, not for health, for your eternal soul. He's better than what you think he is. So when you focus on the person and purpose of Jesus, you will see that he is better than what you think he is. Let's pray.